Okay, now the lecture proper. Um, eight ways that you can motivate yourself to meditate more. This is because last week we asked the question, what is it to make spiritual progress? And why am I not making it? <laughs> so a quick review of last week's material. The first thing that we have to stress, we stressed it last week and we must stress it again this week, that in an ultimate sense, there can be no such talk of progress. Ultimately speaking, absolutely speaking, you already are at your essence nature, whole, perfect and complete, right? The central claim of Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta or Advaita Shaiva or any non-dual school of philosophy is that you are not fallen from a state of grace. You aren't broken and in need of fixing. You aren't deficient in need of growing. There is nothing that you don't have that you need to add on to you. And in fact, there's nothing real that you have that you need to get rid of also. You are already awareness absolute, you know, bliss absolute. Chidananda Rupaha Shivoham Shivoham. I am existence absolute. I am consciousness absolute. I am bliss absolute. I am Shiva. I am Shiva. You know this. So you'll come to a lecture or read a book, and the first claim is you are that awareness in which every experience comes and goes. You know, and so the error is to assume that you are the body and mind, which are themselves experiences that come and go. So the first teaching that we always get in any of these contexts is to say, you are the witness of the experiencers, but the mistake comes in thinking that you are the experiencer. So insofar as I take myself to be the body, I have a problem. And that problem is old age, sickness and death. Insofar as I take myself to be a mind, I also have a problem, which is that pleasure quickly follows pain, that pain swiftly attends to pleasure, that my loved ones will pass away or leave me or fall out of love with me, that my things will either go away and I'm riddled with anxiety every day to try to maintain them, or even if they don't go away, I lose my taste for them. They're not enough for me. So insofar as I am a body, I must suffer. You know, I'll suffer because there's pain and I will believe it to be my pain. There's death and I will fear it, believing it to be my death. Since after all, the body creates the brain and the brain creates consciousness apparently, right? In some grand leap of logic, the firings in the neurosynaptic fibers somehow produce this phenomena of consciousness. And in previous lectures, we've talked in depth as to the error in that line of reasoning. You know, very briefly, the error there is the presupposition of matter and energy as being fundamental and prior to consciousness. The error is that never have we ever experienced matter and energy objectively and independently apart from consciousness. So at the very least, we're forced to admit that matter slash energy and consciousness are invariably concomitant. You can have consciousness without matter and energy, as in the case of deep sleep or deep meditation, but you can never have matter or energy without consciousness. Who will be there to verify such a thing? You know, so if you've made that error, I am the body and the body produces consciousness. Therefore, if the body dies, I die. Then there will be great fear because death will be a real thing to you. And also there will be great grief because you will feel like the death of your loved ones is their actual end in some sense. But also, there will also in, in the same breath be great frustration because if you think you are the body, then you will live like a body. You will live for pleasure to gratify the senses and to get safety and security. But very quickly, you realize that it's never enough. Everything that you get becomes the new normal. There's a habituation going on. And so you're never quite scratching that itch. We've argued before, if you really were the body, then when the body was satisfied, you would be satisfied. In other words, as you're lying down in a nicely air conditioned room, post an orgasm and a big meal, you should be perfectly content, right? But very quickly, that sense of contentment comes and goes, and you're left feeling like, I want something else now. There must be more to it than just this. We can't be the body. And if we assume that we are, there's problems. Now, if we assume that we are the mind, again, there's that feeling of a contraction, a kind of anxiety. Our life becomes full of worries and concerns, and everything becomes so heavy and serious. Uh, so yeah, Brett is asking, what is the non-dualist explanation of changes to the brain? Yes, re resulting in changes of personality. Here, we are mixing up the word personality with consciousness. Personality is not the conscious one. 
Consciousness is the one that is aware of the personality. How can I be Nish when I am aware of a Nish? So Nish is contingent on the mind. You're right. If I lose a part of my brain, like Phineas Gage, Phineas Gage, right? Uh, maybe Nish will change. He might become more violent or whatever. But a change in Nish as a personality is not a change in me, the conscious witness of that personality. That's the distinction. Anytime uh, we find that something is changing, and we think it is consciousness. Yes, this is a cup, exactly. If we think it's consciousness changing, chances are what we've done is we've mixed up consciousness with one of its objects. Most likely the mind, the mind stuff, thoughts. Consciousness is subtler than any thought we can have about it. So Brett is spot on, the idea of the cup. Yes, exactly, a category error. Yes, the mind is an object, whereas the witness is the subject. So to attribute anything to the witness, that is attributable to the object is a category error. Yes, precisely right. It's like saying the number two is red. The numbers and colors are different, so subjects and objects are different. You can't study the subject with the same criteria that you use to study the object. So, the first teaching we get then, and this is the beginning point of any of our classes really, because it's the absolute view, it's the view we would call it, samyak drishya, the right orientation to reality, the truth. And it's not an affirmation, it's not a superimposition. It's what you might call a, a direct revelation of what is already the case. And it should be immediately obvious, at least to the intellect. So when we say, you are not the things you are aware of, that should immediately free you. It should free you from feeling like you are the body. Just because you are experiencing the body doesn't mean you are the body. And that should come with some relief. There should be a huge sigh of relief, a sense of, surrender and release then you truly feel the verse prakrityaiva cha karmani kriyanani sarvashaha in the bhagavad gita krishna says one sees who sees that nature alone is the doer the body digests its own food it breathes its own air it lives and dies by its own rhythms it gets sick when it gets sick it, it heals when it heals you know it does its own stuff really uh, even in the case of free will, right, if I say, I decide to lift my hand, the problem with this is I assume that I'm controlling the flow of efferent and afferent neurons that somehow lifts my hand. One stroke and I won't be able to lift my hand. So I'm at the mercy of the body. And even if I'm in control of my arm, I'm probably being caused by some previous psychological thing, like I was conditioned to raise my arm. So the whole conversation of free will comes. But anyway, once we hear this teaching, there should be a sense of, ah, I'm not the body. You know, I can relax. You know, whatever happens to the body is not happening to me. We can really say with Ashtavakra, you know, na hum or, or na te deho, na, na tvam deho, na te deho, bokta karta na vabhavan. The body is not yours. You are not the body. You are not the doer, nor are you the enjoyer. And then he says, um, Nira Peksha Sukamchara. Knowing this, move about happily. Chidruposi Sada Sakshi. Nira Peksha Sukamchara. Without any want or need or fear or expectation, move about happily. So that should happen once your intellect perceives the truth that is being offered. How can I be the body when the body is an experience and I am the experiencer of that? And with that, there should come an insight, a revelation. And it should free you from fear, you know. It should change your entire relationship to the body from one of strain and, and contraction into one of effortless easefulness. But let's be honest, for many of us, that remains an intellectual conviction, but not yet an actual experience. We know, we've read enough, we've attended enough lectures, we know that we're not the body. We've done our Vedanta. Yet, why do we still act as if we were? Remember, we said last week, Nisargadath Maharaja's incredible observation. Someone asked him, how did you become enlightened? And he said, well, my guru told me I was Brahman. I believed him and I acted accordingly. That's the key. It's not enough that he believed his guru. He acted accordingly. He lived according to what he realized, or really what he believed in. He had such shraddha, such faith, that he believed it. So right now, even if you can't see it yet as an intellectual fact, 
Even on the level of faith, all these scriptures all over the world are telling you, you are the soul eternal, not the body. The body comes and goes. You remain. You know, all the scriptures are saying that. I know this is ad populum. There's a fallacy here. Just because everyone said it doesn't mean it's true. But there's also an, another fact of corroboration. It's a corroborated idea in all the major world traditions that you are not the body. So even short of an intellectual realization, the path of faith is open to you. You're welcome to just accept that because the happiest, most capable people in the world seem to be saying it. And I'm speaking here not of like Steve Jobs and stuff. Power to him. I'm speaking of rishis. You know, the great seers and sages of spirituality who embody not just productivity. And they had that. And look at Vivekananda and his gargantuan efforts. I recently found out, I hope this book will come out, but Vivekananda's conversations with people like Tesla and people like um, Rockefeller and all of that. Now, many artists, I recently, I forgot his name, but there was an artist who read Raja Yoga and changed his whole style and became like a minimalist because he was so inspired by these yogic ideals of purity and focus. But I, I'm excited for the book of Vivekananda's effect on modernism. The other day, a monk was telling me how modernism, you could even argue, was directly caused by Swamiji's message in the West. You know, he really kind of was, like, they called him the cyclonic monk. He really worked here. So you can see, not only was incredibly productive, beyond the scale of the Silicon Valley mogul, you know, like productive, uh, but also deeply happy, deeply peaceful. So when we look at those people and we say they must be doing something right, we hear from them the same thing, that uh, we are not the body and we are not the mind. The mind with its stream of thoughts is nothing but an experience. The thoughts are a bit like sensations. So you could say the mind, brain and body, all of that belong to nature. You are, as Brett pointed out, something wholly different, categorically different. The witness. Rest in that. A very simple aphorism is, you are not the things that you are aware of. You know, be aware of what you are not. Rest in what you are. It's like a Sankhya aphorism. Yes, and Prithi says it nicely. The body is an instrument, you know, so it's like a tool. I use the knife to cut vegetables. The problem comes when I don't know how to put the knife down. And when I'm holding the knife as I talk to my wife, I'm going to get in trouble. Right? The idea is you got to put the knife down, um, but we don't know how to put the body down. It's this tool that we can't seem to use as a tool. It binds us. So this is the wisdom teaching, what you would call the shravana, the listening portion, which actually should be the beginning and end of spiritual life. We should be told the truth. We should nod our assent, having understood and realized it for ourselves. Then we should live according to it. Huh? But, and this is where today's lecture starts, but that's not usually our experience. Haven't you met people who could write books on this stuff? Who are so knowledgeable about Advaita Vedanta, who could lecture you under the table? And yet, when you walk around with them, even to the grocery store, you see them acting in ways wholly misaligned with what they claim to have realized. In previous lectures, we've called this the Internet Chatroom Brahmagyani Phenomenon where we learnt all the appropriate Sanskrit words, we can certainly hold our own in debate. You know, we can go to ISKCON and even best some dualist in debate. We can do that, but our life hasn't yet meaningfully improved. Beyond a few superficial changes, you know, it hasn't meaningfully improved yet. We haven't yet attained that which was promised. Dukkha Nivriti, the permanent cessation for suffering, all suffering categorically must end. By the way, this doesn't mean grief ends. Pain will be there, grief will be there, suffering will be. Grief will be experienced as beauty, pain as enlivenment. Hmm? Pain will be there, grief will be there, but it won't be that cloying, stuck, contracted, dark kind of... You know, it won't be that. It will be, ah, oh, my heart is broken. And you'll write a poem like Rumi or something. You know? And arguably, even that goes away to some extent. So, um... First thing is Dukkha Nivriti, the permanent cessation of all suffering. And to me, the more important thing, Ananda Prapti. You could even say spirituality starts with peace and then evolves into bliss and ecstasy. You know, the, the, beyond peace, beyond Shanta, just that simple sense of, ah, oh, I'm not suffering anymore. There's one more step, which is the attainment of that which sets your soul on fire. The, you know, sorry to use the Pinterest kind of adage there. But that that excites you, full of joy you should be, radiant, not just like peaceful. This is not bad. 
This is not good. This simply is. Okay, that's better than, oh, I need this, I need that, oh my god, I, I don't want, that's obviously better than that. But it's not as good as, ah, I'm in love, this is Kali, that's Kali, everything is Kali, I'm so excited, this is so beautiful, you're all Kali. That's better than simple, mm, you know, both are present together, but the full attainment of spirituality, as promised by the South Asian spiritual traditions, um, is twofold, you know, the ending of suffering, Dukkha Nivriti, and the attainment of the supreme bliss, ananda prapti. You could even say it's a two-step punch. First, you realize you're not anything except awareness. Then you realize only awareness is and all of this is nothing but awareness. And then you can say like Ramakrishna, it's all a mansion of mirth, mojar kutti. Uh, you know, a mansion of mirth. It's all delightful. Everything is exciting. Swami Brahmananda Maharaj, our Parampara Guru, says over and over, Amal and I, you know, how lucky. Our Parampara Guru says, um, Sp life begins, like spiritual life begins after Nirvikalpa Samadhi. We all think that that's the end, you know, that we get to this great Samadhi and then, oh, we did it, game over. No, Swami Brahmananda is saying that's when your spiritual life begins. In fact, Ramakrishna would say time and time again, faith and devotion is not possible before the vision of God. Remember the promise of Indian spirituality, as Swami Vivekananda said, if there is a God, I must see him. We're very empirical in this way. Don't just believe things because someone said it. God forbid you simply just believe what we're told. No, test it. See for yourself. And everyone can and will, in time, have a vision, an immediate perception of divinity in whatever form they like. Teresa of Avila is not going to see a little blue boy playing a flute. She's going to see Jesus. And that's who she loves. And Lord Chaitanya is not going to see a tall European or Mediterranean man. He's going to see a little blue boy, a blue boy playing a flute. You know, that's just what's going to happen. So, and, and Swami Vivekananda asked Ramakrishna, have you seen God? And Ramakrishna, without missing a beat, said, yes, I see God and I can talk to God. I see God more clearly than I can see you. And you know, Vivekananda, Western trained intellect, super rational. He thought that Ramakrishna's visions were hallucinations. He was moved by the truth in, in the, the texture, tone of truth in what Ramakrishna was saying, you know? Anyway, if there is a God, you must see that God. And that usually happens as a result of spirituality. You know, it's kind of the, almost the, 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 the gift that you get. Faith and devotion come like the sun following the rosy dawn of your longing. Now, Swami Brahmananda, after he had Nirvikalpa Samadhi, he would walk into like temples and have an ecstatic vision of whatever God there was in that temple. So in one case, he walked into a Vishnu temple and he saw mother, divine mother, you know, and he thought, wait, what? I'm in a Vishnu temple. Why am I not seeing Vishnu? You see, everywhere he goes, he sees the deity of that temple. But in this Vishnu temple, he saw mother and he was perplexed. He sees Vishnu all the time. Oh, Rama, Krishna, why is he seeing mother? So he went to the priest and he asked, and apparently it came out that it used to be a temple to mother. And then the influence of Ramanujacharya in the south had converted it to a Vishnu temple. So interestingly enough, he saw mother in mother's place. Just like those people saw uh, Mother Mary in the place of the Mayan goddess, or Aztec, Toltec goddess, sorry. I think Angela, if she's here, she'll tell you more about it. But there was a temple consecrated to a Toltec goddess. And that's where the Virgin Mother Mary or Lady of Guadalupe appeared to uh, Juan uh, Diego, no? San Juan Diego. Interesting, right? Or how there are many temples in Rome to Holy Mother Mary that were previously temples to the goddess Sibylle or something. So it's interesting. Anyway, this is a tangent. Spiritual life begins and life begins. The joy of life begins as a result of attainment. So I caution the internet chat room Brahma Gyani. You've understood, but have you realized? You've read the Nisargadatta Maharaj. You've read Ramana Maharshi. You're familiar with the arguments, but why don't you act according to it? What's the problem? What's, what's the matter? I say to you. You know, you believe it, you know it to be true. Search your feelings, Luke. You know it to be true. But why do you act as if it wasn't? The road ahead is blocked. Turn around. You know, um, but if you're still driving down the same road, oh, look at this dog, so cute. If you're still driving down the same road, uh, wolf, if you're still driving down the same road, then clearly you don't yet know the road is blocked. So what's the problem? We'll quickly diagnose it now. The problem is, Twofold. One, the mind has not yet been made pure enough 
to perceive the subtlety of what is being said. That's the first problem. We don't really understand it. We might have a superficial understanding, but we don't have the ears to hear what is really being spoken. As the Christ would say, only he who hath ears will hear. Shravana, he's talking about the first step of Jnana Yoga. Shravana. Now, we don't yet have the purity of mind to perceive directly the truth of what is being conveyed. And I actually mean this in a subtle sense because on one level is the word, on the other level is the vibration and the realization behind those words. Someone who truly has experienced something, when they speak about it, there's a conviction, fervor and fire there that is wholly absent in one who is merely speaking from book learning. Notice, there are many Jimi Hendrix impersonators in the world, but only one Hendrix. Why? I would argue that some of the impersonators can play Hendrix solos better than the man himself. Yet, most people at least, will, or, or true fans, will immediately know, okay, that was Hendrix and that was an impersonator. Because there's something more going on than just the notes and just the melody and just the rhythm. Something more going on than just playing an Olympic white Stratocaster with a certain amp. You know, you can get that same guitar, the actual one that Jimmy played, and you could be so versed in the tab, but it just won't sound like Jimmy. Why? Because you didn't live what Jimmy lived. You know, yeah, technical perfection versus something hidden, the X factor, they call it. You know, I, I sometimes hear like um, chant music, you know, like Hare Rama, Hare Rama, and it sounds so sugary and empty to me. It's like they learnt the words, but they don't yet feel the longing. It's like these musicians are more interested in constructing a spiritual personality than actually feeling the depths of despair of what it truly means to be a lover of God. And you listen to Mira, and hopefully maybe Priti will sing a bit today, I always hope that. If you listen to Mira the way Priti sings Mira, then you will understand. It's more than just Priti's technical precision. It's Priti's longing. It's Mira's longing. You know, the despair she feels at being separated from Krishna. Tulsidas, the poet of the Ramayana said, even one tear wept in the name of viraha, divine longing, is sweeter than all the pleasures of the world combined. So I say to ye, internet chat room Brahmagyanis, you're missing out. You know, you're not eating the mango. You're looking at the mango from behind a glass case, pointing at it and making very astute observations about its fragrance and its texture and its taste, but you have no idea what we're talking about. I speak with passion on this because I felt this frustration in America, where I meet people who seem to know all the right Sanskrit words and who seem to have read our books, but know nothing of Indian spirituality, which is all heart and feeling, you know, which is all authentic realization. And that's what we're all learning together, to feel, you know, to feel this stuff. So, on one level, we don't yet have the purity of mind to perceive the teachings on a subtle, energetic level. Pardon the mysticism here. As Swami Prabhavananda Ji says beautifully, spirituality is caught, not taught. That's the first thing. The second thing, let's say we do though, on a second level, let's say we do catch the teaching. We don't yet have the purity to retain it. Some of you here have had experiences, I know. Some of you have actually had full-blown um, realizations and have maybe spent a week, if not a month, if not a year, if not at least a few hours, if not at least a few seconds, immersed in that, absolutely drenched in that wonderful sense of everything is going to be okay. I am not the body, I am not the mind, so I don't suffer, I'm not worried, nothing can happen to me. And I'm full of joy. I'm full of love for my fellow plants and animals and things. And some of you have felt that. Where did it go? Why did it fade? How did the noise of the world suddenly drown out that beautiful sound of the flute? What happened? The answer is not enough purity to hold what it is you glimpsed. You know, it, it, too many, too much wind. Yes, it is loud. The noise, exactly, so loud. And we haven't yet heard the sound clearly enough to be able to distinguish it. Now, do you remember how at a party, if someone were to say, I don't know, Tony or um, Mikey or something like that, no matter how loud the party is, you'll, you'll hear it. You know, you're usually you'll, you'll, you'll hear your name. Why? Because it's your name. You've heard it being said to you so many times. You know the sound of your name, even in a loud party. Now, if the body is sufficiently pure and if the mind sufficiently marinated in these ideas, then you will hear that flute sound 
the Pranava Shabda, even in the midst of the busy marketplace of the world. Then you can do Ramakrishna's mission of working in the world, you know? So, what do we do now? Yes, Aishwarya is asking the critical question. Now that we know the importance of purity, purity to hear the message and purity to retain the energy of message once the message has been conveyed, what do you do to get that purity? Now, by purity, we don't mean any weird, guilt-ridden, sin-based narrative of puritanical, um, fear-based religion. By purity, we simply mean clarity, precision, and spaciousness. And the only real way to get that on the level of the mind is through practice. So um, remember, on an absolute level, you don't need spiritual practice. Hmm? You are Brahman. You are Shiva. Shiva doesn't need spiritual practice. But Aishwarya and Nish do. Why? Because there is a thin illusory veil separating me from what I am. And that veil, you can call it ignorance. You can call it impurity. I mean, the traditional technical word in Tantra is Mala. Remember, the right-hand tantrikas, the dualists, they believe mala is a real thing. Ontologically, malas exist, and you need puja to surgically remove the mala. However, in um, our kaula, our non-dual version of tantra, we say, no, no, it's not actually a thing. There's nothing actually separating you from truth. The lack of truth being manifested is just a matter of recognition, realization, pratyabhikya. So, what do we do? To one degree or another, practice and meditation. That's the main kind of, the, the main course. Practice ultimately is many things, uh, but today we're talking specifically about meditation. Now, I, I'm kind of speaking to you from a jnana yoga point of view, and in jnana yoga, the yoga of philosophical inquiry into the truth, we say that in order to hear the teaching and truly realize the teaching, you need to have what the Buddha called shamatha, or pure, tranquil mind. The mind needs to be pure enough, and by that we mean the mind needs to be subtle enough to hold this energy. And notice the Buddha, he's a jnani, right? The Buddha is here to teach you something. You know, anityam, manityam, sarva, manityam, all of this. So why are you bothered by anything? It's all coming and going, right? Shunyam, shunyam, sarvam, shunyam. It's all void, relax. The Buddha teaches this, but in order for you to live by what the Buddha teaches, he encourages that you practice meditation intensely. The Buddha's main sadhana is meditation. And then meditation gives you shamatha, the clarity and subtlety of mind to both hear, understand, and finally integrate the teaching. That's what meditation is for. So last week, we talked about the wonderful rewards that you get as a result of walking the spiritual path. Progress is not for Brahman. Progress is for Nisha and Anisha, and uh, Anisha is very far along the path, so I have to speak just for myself. But progress is for Nisha on the path. What will happen? Five things. The more I practice, the more I meditate, my episodes of anger, depression, guilt, whatever my episode might be, becomes less frequent, shorter in duration, and quicker in recovery time. That's one thing that will happen. Another thing is, there will be in my life a current of joy that underlies every single one of my experiences. Like a string of joy that ties together all the beads of my varied experiences. I should feel this perpetual joy all the time. Third, there should be a kind of fearlessness. I should be a little more chill about stuff. Nothing is that big of a deal anymore. And so I can move through this world with a kind of relative ease. Fourthly, I will want to be creative and help others. Because I'm not afraid, I don't spend energy trying to reify this idea of who I think I am. Because I'm full of joy, naturally I want to express that joy in some service. Um, and because I, don't I no longer have episodes, I have more time. I have more time to do stuff. So I should be in my life expressing some work, some creative kind of endeavor. That's all that will come. These are the signs of progress. Episodes become less frequent and shorter in duration. I feel joy most of the time. There should be an undercurrent of, let's say, meaning or beauty as opposed to joy. Then I should be relatively fearless and like not anxious about anything. And finally, I should be full of creative energy and service. These things come as a result of practice. Now, last week we said the main obstacle that's keeping us from having these, let's say, milestones is we don't practice enough. You know how we said there are two components, quantity and quality, but most of us are deluding ourselves. We're saying, I'll get quality. But do we? Can you imagine someone wants to learn guitar and says that the first time they practice, the scale will be like perfect. 
Weird, huh? Who picked up a guitar? I don't know, maybe some people because of some scars from previous births. But how many of us picked up a guitar and immediately played a C mixolydian scale without missing a single note? Like, how many of us? How many of us started something like, I don't know, riding a bicycle and immediately had quality then and there, right? There may be some beginner's luck, but you do it a second time. So your first meditation, whoa, five minutes, you were in. Your second meditation, you spent five minutes thinking, but then you justified how little you practiced by telling everyone, it's quality, my friend, not quantity. <laughs> What fools we are! We cheat ourselves out of the amount of practice it takes to truly make spiritual headway because we believe in our naivety that we can have quality just because we want it. Whew. Forgive us, Father, we know not what we do. How imprudent, you know, to say that I will sit for 10 minutes and suddenly I will have a good 10 minutes of meditation. It might take me actually an hour and a half of sitting to have that, to have a minute, to have a second of good meditation. It might take me an hour and a half. If I'm not practicing for an hour because I think I can somehow magically get those 10 minutes of quality, I am deluding myself. Yeah, right, Brett? That damn bar chord, like... It would be so remiss then to think that if I had to put in all that effort to learn guitar, I somehow don't have to to realize God. Is realizing God so mean a thing that it can be had by anyone just like that without even a little bit of struggle? Ramakrishna would say, struggle a bit. You know, as Ram Prasad sang in that beautiful Bengali poem, dive down deep, O mind. And Ramakrishna adds, what will you get from merely floating on the surface? If you want butter, you must put the milk aside, let it sit and settle into curd, and then churn it. You've got to churn the butter. What good is it to turn the ladle every now and then? You know, it will never, it won't become butter. What good is it to practice? Okay, five, one, okay, I have uh, suddenly inspiration, right? I meditate one hour every day for three days and then forget all about it for two weeks and then pick it up later. Or worse, I meditate like five minutes every day. It's something, but not at your level. Not at your level. That's good for like self-help people who just want a little bit of relief, you know, from... Oh, Brock, I can answer that easily. My guru told me something very beautiful. He said, a good meditation, or actually I should give you two answers. One answer is from uh, a wonderful meditation teacher, Chula Dasa, uh, who said, the only bad practice is the one that you didn't do. That's good because it removes all judgment. That you practiced matters more than really how you practiced in the beginning. Quantity and intensity of like practice, what do you call it, like um, regularity, consistency, that is um, in the beginning more valuable. Yeah, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. Exactly, exactly. So, you, you know, doing a little bit is something. So that's why Chula Dasa says the only sit that is a bad sit is the one that you didn't do. So if you got there for five minutes, remember how last week we said even that is good? Because even that at least sets up a samskara for a future life. You know, if it doesn't flower into attainment, and it can, for some people, like, they just sit and they just hear Tatwa Masi and they're done. Of course, we have to always make exceptions for the Anupaya people who just have spontaneous realizations. That can happen. But frankly, most of us, we are benefited very little by five minutes, though we are indeed benefited. We are indeed benefited. It, yeah, as, as uh, Bernal is saying, it builds momentum, it kind of gives you, what do you call it, like a sense of, I did it, you know, at least I did five minutes, and I, I'm doing it at my regular times every day. But, I'm, for a large majority of you, I know your practices, and I know that you're capable of more. Why? Because I know that you truly, truly, sincerely believe in what it is you are reading, learning, studying. So, for you, I encourage you, do more. This is my, my only argument is, if you only practiced guitar for five minutes a day, how long would it take you to get to the place where you can start jamming with others? Right? Um, so the other day, so every Tuesday nights, we have a meditation here in our house. And the other day, someone brought a friend who was very expressive. So this was his first time he had come to meditation. And we sat and I, I did the puja and then I just said, oh, for all of you who are new here, we'll set the timer when you hear the three bells go off, that will be the end of the meditation. Don't get up right away, we'll sing a few songs and then, you know. And then I, and then, and then I said, okay, you'll hear the timer uh, after an hour. And this guy, his face, it was almost like, he was like, 
fuck. You could see it, you know, on his face. He was like, fuck that shit, bro. <laughs> Because when someone told him that he was coming to meditation, he thought it'd be some like hippie dudes, you know, playing like a, a, a hand drum or a singing bowl with dreadlocks, saying a few hippie aphorisms like we're all one man, put on little Bob Marley, no offense to any of that, and then just suddenly meditating for five minutes and saying they did it. That's all well and good if you're in the California New Age circle shopping for a personality, but this is different. This is actual spirituality. So they come here, yeah. No, but but this is the point of my story. He came, he sat there. Oh, Brett, all right. Oh, how nice that you're here. Good, uh, good, good to hear from you, Brett. Let's let's all let's meet. You know, on Zoom at least. And now I'm in America, Brett. We should actually meet somewhere. I'll come to Michigan or something. Oh no way! I'm in I'm in Los Angeles. Okay, wait. Here. Text me, okay? <gasps> it went to the waiting room participant. Don't go there. This is my number. So text me, come visit, and I'll come visit you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Brett. Brett is my teacher. Ex excellent debater. You know, I still use ice. Identify, criticize. You know, I, I I'm still so enamored of that. Goodbye, Brett. Jaima. So, um, this is the point of the story. He came, and he was like, you know why? He didn't believe he could do it. He thought he only could meditate five minutes a day. He told me, you know, I asked him, I was like, so have you meditated before? He was like, yeah, I meditate five minutes every day. I'm like, awesome. What style? Buddhist style, Vipassana, following the breath. I'm like, awesome. Now we're going to meditate. And when I said an hour, he was horrified. He thought that all he could do was meditate for five minutes a day. What nonsense. Why do you sell yourself these delusions? You can do way more. Bruce Lee always says, you know, um, the only limits are in the mind. Truly, because here's what happened. We sat for an hour and he, of course he got peer pressured, right? There are like 15 people in the room and they're all sitting there meditating. He realizes he's trapped, he can't go anywhere. By the way, some people have gone. You know, there have been times where I hear someone get up in anger, stomp to the door and slam it. There have been people who have not responded well, but to his credit, he sat there. He sat there for the whole meditation. And when he finished, he opened his eyes and his face was bathed in radiance and also pride and he said to me with a kind of like self-affirming empowered voice it's very soft and very humble he said i never thought i could do it you know and my feeling was no one ever thinks they can do it until they do that's an important point no one thinks they can do it until they do you know so why not that's the thing i'm speaking to you now and i want to close this lecture soon with the eight things. And I'm speaking to you now as people who have sensed the value of spiritual life and want to live it at like an intermediate to advanced level. I'm speaking to an advanced group here, not like beginners who just came to this, you know? So some of you who are maybe just coming to this, if you're watching a video of this or whatever, this might be very like a big turnoff. You know, I'm like, oh my God, I, to me, it's I, that I do two minutes, bro, that's a victory. But I have to say to you, why settle for that? You know, go for it. I'm speaking to you now with the premise that you recognize the need for meditation, yet, as we expressed last week, are struggling to find the motivation to actually get there on the mat, to practice for the duration of time that you know you need to practice for. So you know you want quality, and you know that quality is on the other side of correct intensity, which comes through intention, persistence, regularity, consistency, and most of all, quantity. I would argue with quantity comes quality. So how do you get it? How do you practice like a master musician practices guitar or piano? How do you practice like an athlete who wakes up early and trains every day on the track for the Olympics, you know? That's the, I think, league that you're all kind of in. I hope. I, I, I know. I know. Um, and I hope that you know too. Okay, so what are the eight things? How do we motivate ourselves to meditate more? Having identified what spiritual progress is, that is the degree of manifestation and living according to the truth that was conveyed, having identified that one of the major obstacles to spiritual practice is just not practicing enough, how then do you motivate yourself to practice as much as you know you need to practice? Eight things. The first one, discern if materialism truly brings happiness or not. That's step one. You need to do a kind of investigation and inquiry into the ideals sold to you by the marketplace of ideals. 
So you have to really ask if buying the shampoo, the advertisement told me to buy, will really make me happier, you know? So there are a few ways that you can do this. In one sense, you can do it by examining your own experience. So you got some money and then it wasn't enough. It's never enough. Financial struggle never ends. Everybody at every strata of society, whatever their financial situation is, is usually stressed out about it. You know, you never escape financial constriction. So you examine your own experience. You say, okay, I had this much money and it wasn't enough. Then I had 10 times that much and I still feel like it isn't enough. I still feel insecure. Um, so money doesn't give me security. I, I can't fill that hole that way. Or pleasure doesn't quite fulfill me lastingly. I chased an orgasm, I got it. Then I had another orgasm in a more like sexually enticing situation with a better partner didn't do it for me. And then I had some foursome in a club downtown. Again, didn't do it for me. I, I looked for pleasure sexually and I just couldn't get off. I looked for pleasure sensually in tastes and in sounds and all of that and it didn't meaningfully do it for me. Beyond a few fleeting glimpses into eternity, most of the time I found myself back in the same place I've always been, if not worse because now I have a habit. So that's the thing. You must investigate your own experiences with pleasure power and money such that you realize that these things can't really do it for you. A better way to do it though is to extrapolate by looking at those who have it at its highest. So I might not be a billionaire, but that doesn't stop me from looking at how that billionaire's life is. Most of the time, I don't find happiness. And I teach in Brentwood here in Los Angeles. I teach at a, a private school and I meet a lot of parents who are seriously wealthy you know, like sultan level wealthy and miserable. I can't tell you the number of par uh, parents who are like fighting in the middle of divorce proceedings, whose kids hate them, who are estranged from their children, who can't even sit at dinner together, despite all the, the, that they have. It seems to be hindering, not helping. You know, the stress and the anxiety and the constant need to do and grow, it's horrific. And so when you look at that, you say, even if I was a billionaire, that doesn't bring happiness. Because look at all these billionaires in the midst of suffering. So you could watch like movies, I don't know, watch The Wolf of Wall Street or something, or read biographies of, of great rock stars and, and hear the accounts of people who have everything in a material sense and are still not fulfilled. The world is full of stories of billionaires who have left behind their fortune, left behind their companies, and started a small nonprofit or moved to Papua New Guinea or become like some mountain trekker or something, right? The world is full of examples of people who got the world, were disappointed by it, and put it aside in order to pursue uh, things that were more authentic and true. So you can learn from them and you can learn from your own experience. But make no mistake, no true spirituality is possible until you are firmly convinced that um, the material world with pleasure, power, and money won't fulfill you in the way that you know you deserve to be fulfilled. It cannot give you lasting satisfaction. Never thought I'd see the day a spiritual teacher recommends watching. Yes, <laughs> watch Wolf of Wall Street, you know? I think that's a great movie uh, depicting the trap of wealth and the hunger of it. You know that myth, that Greek myth of Tantalus? He goes to hell and he's hungry, but food is just out of reach. He's thirsty, but water is just out of reach. That's what life in the world feels like. If you think you can be satisfied chasing pleasure, power, and money, then you must chase those things until you realize that they're not doing it for you, you see? There's nothing wrong with pleasure. Have it, have tons of it. Nothing wrong with money. Go and start your financial empire. Move to Wall Street if you will, you know? Some people got the wrong message from Wolf of Wall Street. They're like, I wanna do that. Good, do it, you know? Do everything that you think you need to do to get what you think you need from the world so that you can see that it's not enough. It doesn't do it. Um, it can take lifetimes, truly. It can take several lifetimes of trial and error. That's Shiva's game. Shiva wants to experience all of that. But eventually you realize there's just no winning. The good things create anxiety because you fear that you could lose them. And they set up an expectation that the future usually fails to meet. So the good things ultimately become bad things. The neutral things, because they are not good enough, are ultimately bad things. And the bad things are, of course, bad things. So eventually you have this Buddhistic sense of, oh man, there's no way to win insofar as I'm chasing pleasure in the world. This is called Viveka. Viveka is that discernment that the things in the world can't fully satisfy me, so I can't live for them. It's not to say they're bad. They had a part to play in your journey. 
You know, it's experience ultimately that Shiva wanted. And you've experienced these things, but now you've realized it's not going to quite do it. So you've discerned, you've created now that understanding, Viveka, it's spelled like this, Viveka, which means discernment. You've discerned now that um, materialism that is pursuing things and pleasures as the be-all, end-all of life is ultimately not going to do it. However, um, there is a certain momentum, right, that we've built up from living in a world of material ideals for this entire life, if not several lifetimes. So we need constant reminders. Try to remind yourself as often as you can that ultimately the world is empty. You know, that's the first thing, the first Buddhistic sense of samyak drishti, the right view that these things won't fulfill you. That's called viveka. But you don't have to renounce anything. That's the very important thing. Don't renounce the world yet. It will be very harmful for you to throw everything away unless you're truly finished with it. So enjoy what you need to enjoy and watch, yes, as Kat is saying, how it renounces you. But how will it renounce you? Now the second thing, cultivate spirituality. And um, there are four things to say here. The, 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 so first one was discern if materialism brings happiness or not. The second one is read holy books. Read accounts of mystics like Teresa of Avila or Saint John of the Cross or of course my favorite is the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, read what it's like to live a life totally and wholly absorbed in God. In fact, even if you pick up like the Gospel of Matthew or John or something, you can kind of like really envy the life that the Christ lives. He sleeps on the ground, the sky, his roof, eating whatever food that chance may bring, well cooked or ill, it matters not to him, you know, wearing simple garments and hanging out with everybody, living peacefully and harmoniously with one and all, how gracefully he took his final end, you know, how beautiful the Christ's life was. So you can be inspired by that. You could want to be Christ-like and walk the way of the Christ in the simplicity, purity and burning passion that he embodied, you know. When you read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, you'll see what joy there is in a mystic's life. He's always beaming and smiling. His room is full of song and dance and people are there all the time. It's like truly a veritable Garden of Eden. The wedding feast spoken of in Mark, it truly is like a party, you know, all the time in Ramakrishna's place. Uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful Leela. So study Ramakrishna. More importantly, study the direct disciples of Ramakrishna. Swami Turiyananda, Swami Brahmananda, Nikhilananda, who wrote about Swami uh, Vivekananda, you can read that autobiography of Vivekananda. Of all the monks, Arope, Aropeshananda Maharaj, uh, Amal was saying how very few people want to be Vivekananda, right? Because of all of them, he had the hardest life. Yet, despite all of that, if you look at his poems, especially towards the end of his life, you see a deeply happy and fulfilled person. So, when you start to read these biographies, uh, yeah, it's so rad, right? Brahmananda's eternal companion, Vivekananda's biography that Swami Nikhilananda wrote, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. In fact, Swami Saradananda's Leela Prasanga, which is the biography of Ramakrishna. Um, all these things, Theresa, St. John, Evagrius of Pontius, um, Augustine, Confessions of St. Whatever you read, it will inspire you. Yeah, that's one of my favorite books, Eternal Companion. This reading, this imbibing of holy books, will whet your appetite for spiritual life. You see, it's not enough that you see that the world is empty. You must see that the spirit is full. Because if you realize that money, power, and pleasure won't do it for you, it can easily degenerate into nihilism if you don't have a sense for what will. And so when you read holy books and at the same time discern whether or not materialism makes you happy, you will have that sense of spirituality makes me happy. Everything beautiful about the world has been awareness becoming aware of itself. And you learn that from these books, you know. So the second way, way to meditate more is to read more holy books. You know, And I'm saying don't read books that are like intellectual. Read the actual accounts of mystics. Try to limit your reading as far as possible to enlightened masters. You know, And how will you know? The book will have a vibration to it a certain kind of spiritualizing effect. So read those holy books. And of course, there's a list that you'll find in the Discord of good books from various different spiritual traditions. That's the second thing. The third one, visit holy places. So as far as possible, try to go to the temples near you. Whatever, whether it's a church or a temple. Some of us I know have hang-ups with churches. And I know some churches uh, on Sunday 
are just a place of breeding hate, right? On Sunday sometimes, what you get is a very passionate and charismatic preacher, but usually what he's preaching about is something political. Vivekananda was very against that. God and truth are our only politics. All else is trash. People are all trying to engage us on Modi and all that stuff. And we're like, we're just not going to talk about that. You know, um, it's not our thing. But maybe church has become that for you, like this bigoted political place. Well, then don't go on Sunday. Go on, I don't know, Thursday afternoon when there's no one there or something. Go on some days when it's quiet and then just sit there. Sit there and imbibe the stillness, purity and peace. If you can. And if you have serious hang-ups with the churches near you, go to the Hindu temple, go and eat the prasad, go and watch the puja, you know? Go to the Buddhist monastery and just sit there and feel the vibration of a hall in which many Buddhists have meditated. Some of you like to go to nature. Whatever is a holy place, go to that place. I, I notice a place is made holy not by its natural beauty as much as by its... Um, uh, propensity for hosting spiritual people. You know, so a place like that tends to become naturally beautiful, but what's beautiful about it is that many people have meditated there, prayed there, experienced spiritual things there. One beautiful thing about meditating in the Vedanta Temple Hollywood is that many people attain Brahma Jnana there. Meaning many people attained the highest state of spirituality there. You know, and many direct disciples had also meditated uh, there. So it's this idea of like... <gasps> You know, wow, disciples of Masharada have meditated there. Like, there, there's a vibe there. So even if it's empty, it will help you to go there. Go to holy places. The fourth thing, and this is the most important, remember, a holy place is made holy by the people who frequent it. So frequent places uh, like that, but more than that, hang out with those people. So the fourth way to meditate more is to, as often as possible, be in the company of holy men, women, and people. What makes a holy man a holy man? Just that they love God. Just that they've renounced everything for God. That's it. There's no special qualification. If you sense that someone truly and passionately loves God, loves spirituality, try to spend as much time with that person. You know, you'll catch it. You'll catch that from them. Spirituality, as Swami Prabhavananda Ji said, and we'll reiterate, is not taught, it's caught. So Ramakrishna would say over and over, householders would ask him, is it possible, Thakur? You know, is it possible for us to be enlightened? And he said, why not? Householders can be enlightened. But above all, you must have sadhu sangha. You must have association with the holy. You must have time in which you meet true devotees. Yeah, also not only do you benefit from holy company, and the, yeah, exactly, you, you give it. Isn't that nice? It's like such a wonderful way to bring a, your own energy to the potluck. So try to make friends with monks, with nuns with people who are in this full time. Sadhu means one who has renounced the world. They don't have to be monks or nuns. There can be householders who have also renounced the world. Yes, absolutely, look at all these people in the room. Don't you feel elevated here, looking at all these faces? Now, another way to identify a holy person. Many people wear orange, but they might not be holy. And many people don't, and they might be supremely holy, though outwardly they don't show it. So, how do you identify what's good company and what's not? Like Swami Sarvadevananda Maharaj, he came and he, you know, someone asked a great question. How do you know, um, yeah, right? How do you know that someone is enlightened? That was a wonderful question that we asked. And remember what Maharaj said? He said, it's hard to tell, but usually in the presence of such a person, you feel elevated, you think spiritual thoughts. That's the thing about Ramakrishna. People would visit him. And when you were with Ramakrishna, the spiritual stuff that seemed so unreal to you in Calcutta, in the midst of your day-to-day -day job, suddenly felt the realest thing to you when you were with Ramakrishna. And that world of Calcutta, that humdrum of the marketplace, felt unreal. That was the effect Ramakrishna had on people. They couldn't deny his spirituality. Though they had many disagreements with his philosophy, like young Narendranath, who resisted every step of the way, uh, still he was like drawn to Ramakrishna because it was undeniable the effect that Ramakrishna had on young Narendranath, later Swami Vivekananda. So when you meet someone like that, in whose company you think spiritual thoughts, when you feel elevated by that person, whether they live in your city or you meet them on the Discord, one of my intentions was to create a place where people could have sadhu satsang like this. Um, make friends, you know. Look at the people in this room, text them. Some of them are in cities near you. Start to curate your friend group. Be careful. As Swami Mahayogananda Priti said so beautifully, don't overestimate your effect on people and don't underestimate their effect on you. 
So if you're hanging out with worldly people and you think that through your example, they will come to spiritual life, we're deluded. More likely, they will drag us away from our path. So it's better to try to frequent holy places and spend as much time with holy people as possible. One of the greatest blessings in my life had been the company of my grandfather and recently the, unfortunately, exorbitant amount of time that I spent at the monastery with my friends there and my teachers, you know. Uh, truly, I feel like being in their presence is the best thing for my practice. And let's explain this a little more because on one, one level, you could say you are getting something on the level of Shakti, right? Like a Shakti path. You're getting a spiritual transmission. So on one level, there's subtle energetic work happening. But let's not even go to that extent. Let's not get so mystical and, you know, woo-woo about it. It's also the simple fact that you get to actually see what happy people look like. That's maybe more important. Hey, Prithi is there. So nice. Nice to see Prithi. But uh, you get a sense of like what happiness looks like. You know, my guru is the ultimate embodiment of happiness, like a child, so full of joy and mirth. And so when you see that, it inspires you. It makes you feel like that's possible. Spiritual life gives me that. You know, in one of the tantras, it says, don't accept a guru who can't prove to you the efficacy of a mantra. No, when you get a mantra from a guru, it's because that guru has chanted it, right? They should be the fruit of that mantra, meaning their very life should prove to you how powerful the mantra is. I believe in my mantra because I see what it's done for those who have chanted it. You know, and that's the beauty of it. If you spend time with holy people, you will see what happiness looks like. You will know that it's possible and you will pursue it with all your heart. I can't bear missing meditation because I know what will come about as a result of doing it. That joy that I saw in my grandfather, that I see in my guru, that I see in my brothers and sisters on the path. So that's sadhu satsang. So much for that. The fifth thing, set regular times and never deviate as far as possible. Yes, things will happen, right? Things will come that take you from your practice, but don't budge so easily. Why are we all so easily swayed by the things that seem so important? Are they important? You have already discerned the material world cannot give you anything. You know that. So why do you allow it to take you from your noontime, from your dusk meditation, from your dawn meditation? Where are you when the sun rises? Why not are you? Why are you not on your mat? What happened? Probably, right, some other thing came up. I had to go to work. I had to... Notice, the world will take you, sweep you in its coattails unless you protect your time. You have to say that from 4.30 to the sunrise, that's what they do in Belomat, right? Like from 4 a.m. to the sunrise, they meditate. Swamiji was so particular. You couldn't, if a monk missed 4 to 6 or 4 to 6.30 meditation, they would have to go beg their food that day. You know, even like direct disciples who missed that time would have to go beg their food. Like it's one of the rules that nobody could break. Swamiji was big on rules. Why? He knew that without such a thing, without such a fence, you couldn't protect the sapling of spirituality. Quickly, the cows of the world will come and trample all over it. So your greatest treasure is that early morning time before the sun rises, that noon time that splits the day into two halves, that dusk time when the sun sets, and that midnight hour. Try to catch at least three of those and never deviate. Set a time and set an intention. Say, I know the value of spiritual life. I know what I want. And I know what I want is devotion, knowledge, and renunciation. And I know that I have to meditate to get it. So whatever happens, come hell or high water, the sunrise will find me on my mat. Say that. Before you go to bed, say that. And you will find that even if you're going to bed at 12.30, sometimes I get into my head and I say, but Nish, it would be healthier to sleep. See, I think I'm the body. So, oh, Nish, you, it'd be so healthy if you just get some sleep. And because I set the intention, what happens is I'm not allowed to sleep. The moment 5.30 comes, I'm awake whether I like it or not. You know, you set that intention so you will be forced out of bed. You know? So try to get that hour before the sun rises. As far as possible, catch it. Catch it. The boat is leaving the harbor. On the other side is devotion, knowledge, renunciation. Don't miss the boat. You know, haven't you all woken up early for a flight? You have to go to Spain for your holiday. For that, you can wake up at 3, um, 3 a.m. But for God, no, cannot. <laughs> it would be a tragedy, my friends, to miss the flight departing tomorrow morning for God, for Kailash, um, because you wanted to get a few extra hours of sleep. 
I'm talking to you now as advanced spiritual practitioners. Some of you are still in the stage where you're healing like the body, where you still need to like get that in order. So that's fine. But if you're truly in this and you know that spiritual life is the be all end all, why discount yourself? Like go for it, really go for it, you know? So that's one thing. Okay. Yeah, gonna miss my flight to meet myself. That's more like it, right? That's more. So get that, get that hour. Try to get that, uh, the times that, you, you said it, right? So we say in our tradition that auspicious times are when the sun rises right before that, called Brahma Murta, at good time, uh, noon, uh, dusk, and midnight. I can only do three of those. I tend to miss, if I do midnight, I tend to miss dawn. And if I do dawn, I tend to miss midnight. That's what's been the case in my practice. Um, but sometimes, if there are, if you get four, it's nice. And Swami Brahmananda would say there are places that have certain good times. You know, like, I, I forget exactly, maybe Priti can remind me, but I think in Vrindavan, 12 a.m. was really good. And then in Benares, like, 4, 3 or 4 a.m. was really good. So there are certain places where the vibration is better at certain times as opposed to others. You know, I can't remember exactly what Brahmananda said, but you can feel it out for yourself. Now, let's say you aren't catching dawn, noon, dusk, and midnight for whatever reason. Set your own times. Look at your schedule and decide what times are the best for you to meditate. Think about it in terms of practicality and logistics, but also think about it in terms of like your energy level. You know, after a big meal, will I really be like there for a meditation? Or maybe, as the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra says, a food coma is the perfect time for a meditation. I don't know. Uh, you choose your own times. But whatever time you choose, don't let the cows of the world chew up the sapling of your practice. Hedge it with the fence of intention and tell your loved ones. Say, this is important to me. I need to set up a boundary and my boundary is or communicate your needs. Tell your beloved, your spouse or your family, your parents, say, mom, dad, I have a need and I'm communicating to you my need um, in, in sincerity and honesty and I trust that you will help me protect my needs. My needs are three meditations a day for an hour each time, you know, and I need that time to deepen my spirituality and I would appreciate that you don't disturb me in that time. As Aishwarya is saying, um, we can be disrupted. Why? Because they don't know how important it is to you. Why don't they know how important it is to you? Because you don't know how important it is to you. You have not yet decided that this is a sacred time. So you have not yet protected yourself against these kind of interruptions. Turn the phone off, you know, tell your parents to not disturb you. And even if they come in and say something, just sit there in meditation. It might be rude, but do it, you know. You have to protect your spirituality. Otherwise, quickly the world will take you away from it. So that's the fifth instruction. Set regular times, never deviate. The sixth instruction is, as often as possible, meditate with others. It's nice. It helps, you know, to sit with others for an hour. If you think you couldn't do an hour, come together and meditate together. I know we've been doing a lot of pujas recently, just because that's what we're trying to teach. But, you know, on Mondays before this lecture, we sit for an hour. Come to that. Come to Tuesday night meditation, sit for an hour with us. Come to the Vedanta Temple Hollywood and sit for an hour in the morning, in the noon, in the dusk. Sit and sit together. It keeps it fresh and fun. Seven, um, okay, this is particularly important to me. I know we're well over, sorry. I, I, I feel like this is important. Uh, but we're to the last two. Seven is um, treat it like your job, like your craft, like it's the most important thing in the world. If you have a job, you will go in for your work, no? Even if you're not like really feeling up to it. Haven't you noticed? Why do you take your job as a carpenter more seriously than your job as a spiritual aspirant? Because it makes you money? Hmm, aren't you over that? So the, the important thing is to remember that this is your job. And you know what? For those of us still, who, for whom it's still important to make progress in the world, remember, you need to sharpen the saw. The Silicon Valley people know this. The more they meditate, the better they get at their work. They meditate for productivity. So Steve Jobs knows that if he misses his time in his white room at the start of the day, he's not going to invent the next iPhone. So for Steve Jobs to do his job, Steve needs to go into the room and meditate. So he knows that meditation is part of his job. Most great entrepreneurs know this. They know that if they miss their meditation, that's as good as like not showing up to work. Because meditation is the work. That's where they get their ideas. If whatever job it is that you do, start to convince yourself that meditation is the central part of your efficacy, of your productivity. 
And that's fine. But start to see, many of you here are spiritual aspirants, start to see this as your life's calling. You are all mystics. Many of you as children knew you wanted to be mystics. You knew that in this life, I will be a mystic, you said. Or you felt drawn to it. So make that your craft. A, a guitar player has to practice her craft. And a mystic has to practice her craft. Just like when you have a job, you turn up for that job. You know, similarly, you have to turn up for your meditation as if it was your job. And the final thing, the eighth thing, the last thing to say today is forgive yourself often. This is the most important. Honor the struggle of it all. Get good at starting over. This stuff is hard. And if you don't honor that, if you don't forgive yourself every time you fall short of your ideal, you will quickly burn out. You see, there are two extremes. On one end is the extreme of not practicing enough and giving us so many excuses, pampering us not to practice. On the other hand is driving us like a slave driver and snapping. You know, so that's the other extreme. Yeah, I like that. Med exactly. Prepare the ground for meditation to happen. And in fact, Prithi's making a good point. Everything we're talking about today is preparing the ground. You know from your yoga studies that dhyana is not something you can force. It's something that happens. You can do dharana. You can do yama, niyama. You can do asana, pranayama. You can do puja. Practice is something you do. So yeah, I like that better, Prithi, actually. Preparing the ground. Get there. Sit on the mat. Do the things your guru told you to do or whatever, you know? Now, honor the struggle. Know that this is perhaps the hardest thing in the world that anybody ever did to become unstuck from all your conditioned patterns. The world has taught you, trained you to think a certain way. The world has reified the idea that you are this body, that you are this mind, that the world is a scary place, that you will die, that your loved ones will go away. The world has programmed into you so much negativity that it's not going to all just come undone just because you wanted it. You have to really work at it and honor that it's work, that it's struggle and that there will be difficult days. Try your best not to deviate. But when you deviate, forgive. You know, say, I, I really sincerely tried, but it didn't happen today, and that's okay, because there's tomorrow. So one of the most helpful ways to keep this sustainable is to see every day as a new day. Forget everything that happened yesterday. Don't carry around the guilt of not meeting your ideal for yesterday, because that will harm your ability to meet the ideal today. So think of this as the kind of crowning like jewel of today's like idea. Have high ideals. And thus far, for like an hour and a half, I've been nothing but expressing the highest ideals of practice. Don't drag the ideal down, but at the same time, don't beat yourself up for not meeting it now itself. It's gradual. If today you meditated for only five minutes once a day, awesome, celebrate that. Honor that you did it, but don't settle for that. Tomorrow, try to meditate maybe six minutes. The day after, meditate five minutes twice a day. The day after, meditate five minutes thrice a day. The day after, meditate 30 minutes thrice a day. So, I'm, I'm not, not like literally, but this is in principle the idea. Gradually increase it until you get to the point where you are at least, at least meditating thrice a day for an hour each time. This consider it your rice. It's not, by the way, the be all end all. There's more. And next week, we'll talk about all the other things that you have to do. It's not just meditation. Meditation is one piece of the puzzle. But friends, it's an important piece of the puzzle. And it's becoming very clear to me that we are not having the progress we want to have simply because we aren't practicing enough. So ask yourself honestly, what do you want out of this? To what degree do you want to immerse yourself in spiritual life? And if you truly want to go all the way, why have you not been able to at least put three sessions in for an hour each time, every day? Why not? And at least try it for 21 days and see. I will close with the final idea from Swami Brahmananda, which is, well, don't you want to know if God is real? Don't you want to see if any of this stuff is true? You know, there should be a kind of curiosity. Maybe let your curiosity drive you. So the eight things. Discern, number one, discern whether or not the world will truly make you happy. Viveka. Number two, read holy books. Number three, visit holy places. Number four, sadhu satsang, spend time in holy company. These things will create vairagya. 
From having discerned the world is unfulfilling, having discerned spiritual life is, you will naturally gravitate towards spirituality and leave the world behind. Number five, set regular times for your practice at least thrice a day and never deviate. Be like a Muslim. Even in the middle of war, they will make time to pray. There are five prayers a day. By the way, Eid Mubarak, everyone. It's Eid, right? It's the end of Ramadan, so I'm grateful for you all. I'm so thankful that you're here with me. Six, uh... Meditate with others. Meditate with others. Seven, treat meditation like your job. You clock in every day, no matter what. It's your job, it's your craft, it's your life. And eight, eh? Eight, honor the struggle. Forgive yourself often. Let every shower be like a cleansing of the past. Today is a new day, friends. So as we chant to close the lecture, let's all together resolve to leave every moment that has preceded this one alone. Done. It's gone. It's finished. Now, as we close today's class, as we finish today's chant, see this moment as the first moment of the rest of your life. What will you do with it? Om Namah Shivaya Satatam Panchakritya Vidhayane Chidananda Ganna Svatma Paramatava Basine Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Panamastu All this is verily Shiva. May it be a blessing. Peace, peace, peace.